Revelation chapter 12. We're going to jump right into it this morning. So funny, a lot of people say revelations, but it's, it's, it's only one revelation, amen? John had one revelation. Revelation chapter 12. Give me amen when you get there. Amen. We're going to pick it up in verse 7. And this is what the Bible reads. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you, and he is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. What an incredible passage of Scripture we read here in Revelation chapter 12. And it talks about this war that's in heaven. And... This would have been a time before, you know, God created Adam and Eve. This would have been a time well before then, but God had established the earth. And here, here he says there's a war in heaven. And in this war, Satan, he fights against Michael and the angels. And you see, it's like, it's, it's not even worth God's time to fight against Satan. God knew he was going to win. So he commissions angel, or I'm sorry, Michael and the angels to fight against Satan. And what happens? Satan loses and he's thrown down to the earth. And here we see in this passage of scripture, it says towards the end, Woe to all the people who live on the earth because Satan was hurled down. And it says that he is filled with fury. He knows that his time is short. And so right now, you and I, as as we go throughout our everyday life, as we go through work, school, uh, whatever it may be, Satan is on this earth. And we know that, that Satan is on this earth. But he's roaming, and he's filled with fury. And right now... You know, we didn't wake up this morning and we didn't put on like, like a physical helmet. Like none of us like physically have on body armor right now. Like none of us are walking around with, with a sword that's made of iron or anything like that. But we're in a spiritual war. And if we could just see through a spiritual lens... That right now we only see this hotel room and we got the banners and the mics and the speakers and some lights... But if we could see spiritually, we would see that right now in the world that we live in, in this very room, there are angels and there are demons. And we are in a spiritual battle. And so because we're in a spiritual battle, we got to be prepared for this battle that we are fighting. And so the title of my lesson for you this morning is Spiritual Warfare. Spiritual Warfare warfare. We are in a war. We are in a fight for our lives. There's a quote that says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. My first point is know your enemy. Know your enemy. In verse 9 through verse 10, we learn something about Satan. It says the great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent, called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, was hurled down to earth. And what is he doing in verse 10? 
He's an accuser. He accuses the brothers and sisters before God day and night. We have to know our enemy. And we're going to look at a few characteristics of Satan. What are some of those characteristics of Satan? One is that he's a deceiver. Right? He leads the whole world astray. Astray means to just, you know, go off the correct path. We also learned that he's an accuser. Right? So Satan will accuse us before God every single day, every single night. Satan is going to throw accusations towards our way. And what are some of those accusations? Some of those accusations could be, you know, that, uh, hey, you're not good enough. That, that's why you didn't get the job. That's why you didn't get the raise. That's why this didn't happen in your life is because you're not good enough. Or Satan may say, oh, you did that again? Surely God will never forgive you. You did it again. You're never going to change. These are all accusations from Satan. There's no hope for you. All of these things are accusations that Satan will try to throw our way. And then he just misleads people. And at one point in time, we were all misled. Right? We were led astray off the correct path. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, this is what Jesus says. We know it. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. These are the words of Jesus. And Jesus isn't talking about our physical life here on earth. Jesus is talking about eternity. There is a, a wide gate, a broad road that leads to destruction. It leads to hell. And there's a narrow road, a narrow gate that leads to life, heaven. And it says only a few people find it. Not even, not even few people do it. A few people find it. So probably even fewer are doing it. According to Jesus, in the world that we live in, a lot of people are going to hell. The world is misled. The world is led astray. And they're deceived. But one question we might ask ourselves is, how does this happen? How does this happen to someone? How is someone misled? What might they be misled by? I believe it's, it's very similar. Some of the things that we could be misled by too. But it's lies. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 42. Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews. They believe him. They believe he's the Messiah. But for Jesus, that wasn't enough. And he tells them they got to hold to his teachings if they want to be his followers, if they want to be his disciples. Then they'll know the truth and the truth will set them free. And Jesus is saying that he would set them free from their life of sin. And he says, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And these Jews, they go on and say, we've never been slaves to anyone. We are Abraham's descendants. And then he's saying, hey, if you're, if you're Abraham's descendants, like you would believe me. I come from God. And then they go on and say, like, we, our only father is God. So they're a little confused. But what does Jesus have to say? In John chapter 8, verse 42. If God were your father, you would love me. For I've come here from God. I've not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. This is how Satan is described. This is a characteristic of Satan. He is a father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. When he speaks, it's all lie, 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 lie. All the lies. Satan is the father. 
And so what are some of the lies? Hey, you don't have to be committed to come to church. You don't have to, you don't have to be in the church. Just be spiritual sometimes. You don't even have to be spiritual all the time. Just, most days, just be spiritual. It's okay. You don't have to actually read the Bible. Like, as long as you have it, it's fine, it's cool. But you don't have to read it. For sure, you don't have to, like, put it into practice. You don't have to do what it says. Just, just read it. If, if you have it, you can read it. Sure, that, that could be great. But you don't have to actually do what the Bible says. These are all lies that the world is filled with. Because Satan has filled the world with lies. He is the father of lies. He said, hey, you'll be fine. Just say a prayer. Say a prayer and everything's going to be okay. As long as you accept Jesus, everything's going to be okay. He is the father of lies. These are the lies that are filled with the world that we live in. This is what we are fighting against. The lies of Satan. Be a good person. Right? That's another one. Be, hey, just be good. Do good. It's okay. No, that's a lie. Yeah. These are all of the lies that the world that we live in, they just eat up. Especially here in America. We just eat it up. These are the lies that Satan throws our way. I don't think this is... I don't think any of us here in this room believe this, but a lot of people believe that Satan is like this red thing with, uh, with, with horns, uh, this ugly thing, and he's got a pitchfork, and you know, like, like that's, that's very Hollywood. The way that uh, we, Satan is depicted is, is very Hollywood. Um, it's not accurate. On what, on like who Satan is, what Satan actually looks like. Satan was an angel. We know he fought against. He was in heaven at one point in time. Satan is an angel, a fallen angel. But we're gonna see in this passage of scripture. I believe for me, probably one of the the, the scariest ways Satan is depicted in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse fourteen. You could just write it down. But it says Satan masquerades around as an angel of light. Satan masquerades around like an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. So what does it mean to masquerade? It means to, to be disguised or pretend to be something. This is what it says about Satan, that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That Satan pretends to be an angel of light. I believe that's one of the scariest depictions of Satan. Because Satan is very crafty. And if we're not careful, Satan will try to use his craftiness on us. And, and he's fighting to use that craftiness on us. He will masquerade as an angel of light. So something that may look like it is right, looks like it, it, it's true, good intention, it could be from Satan. Because Satan masquerades around like an angel of light. You know, if we really think about it, the whole world, in fact, is led astray. And Satan is very crafty. There's 45,000 different ways to follow the one Jesus that we follow. And in those 45,000 ways, they have their own idea of what it means to get into heaven, to be with God. But Jesus said the only way we could be with the Father is through him. There's only one way. And the Bible talks about that one way. And we have to fight to get this truth through to a world that's full of lies. In 1 Peter chapter 5, behind the disguise, behind Satan's disguise, in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8, it says that your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That is who Satan is. He is a lion, a vicious lion. And he's looking for someone to devour. And that someone is you. You are what Satan is trying to devour. You are the one that Satan is trying to attack and kill and destroy. It says he, he prowls around 
Like Satan doesn't sleep. He doesn't stop. Think of a lion. A lion, uh, what a lion does is a lot of the times a lion will roar in order to stun its prey. So things can happen in our lives that happen instantly in order to stun us, almost like the fog of war. Right? We get stunned and we just stop for a, for a brief moment. We might stop doing something that God has called us to do because of a situation in our life. And that's what Satan wants. He wants to stun us. He wants to stop us. Just for a brief moment. If he could just stop you for a brief moment, he'll get you. Lions, what they'll try to do is they, they will try to make their prey stray away from the rest of the pack. So what he tries to do is isolate. That's what a lion will do. They will isolate their prey. And so we can't have an a, a, a individual Christianity. Individual discipleship. We can't think, hey, I'm going I'm to go, I'm going to do this on my own. Like, yeah, I know I got brothers and, Christians in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. I got the kingdom. It's awesome. But, you know, I, I just want to be on my own. I want to do my own thing. No, that is what Satan wants. Satan is a lion and he's looking for someone to devour. It's very easy to be devoured when you separate yourself. When you isolate yourself. Don't isolate yourself. Don't be separated. Because that is exactly what Satan wants. He's lying and he's looking for someone to devour. So we can't do it alone. We have to know our enemy. In a war, no one fights to lose, right? Like, like we're not just out here fighting for God and we're like, all right, yeah, you know, like, we might lose. No, like, like that's, not, that's not a question in our mind. It's like, no, like, our, our goal, our aim is to win, right? So we're not thinking about losing. Whenever anyone fights, whenever anyone is any, any competition, you do it to win, right? And so I believe if, if we're going to win in this spiritual warfare against Satan, right? We got to know our enemy, but we also have to have a solution for success. Yeah. And that's the, t that's the second point. My second point for you is a solution for success. In Revelation chapter 12, solution for success, Revelation chapter 12. In verse 11, give me an amen when we get there. I hope the enemy hasn't made you quiet, amen? No. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. The solution for success. You know, in this passage of Scripture, I believe that very clearly we see what the solution for success is. What is the solution for success? It's bloodshed. That's the solution for success. Bloodshed. In Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we learn that in the blood of, of anything contains the life. In Hebrews chapter 9... It says Christ is a mediator of a new covenant. And it goes on to say that Jesus died for our sins. And it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, Jesus says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The solution for success is bloodshed. Jesus sacrificed, and because of Jesus' sacrifice, his blood now gives us forgiveness of our sins. But what do we see in Revelation? It says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. So even the followers of Jesus, they had to have bloodshed as well. So that is what is needed from you and I. Bloodshed. 
We have to shed our blood. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, In view of God's mercy, you can go there. I'm going to quote it here. In view of God's mercy, it says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So with God's mercy in mind, His compassion, His forgiveness, it says, Offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And that's what we see here in Revelation. Is that the followers, they offered themselves as a living sacrifice. They didn't shrink back from death. No, they went towards death. They died. They sacrificed. And that's the same thing for you and I. This is what God calls us to do. He calls us to be a living sacrifice. But you might ask yourself, why? Why, why me? Why little old me? Why do I have to sacrifice? Right? You might ask yourself that. Like, like what, what is the significance of my sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, other people around me, they sacrifice. People before me, they sacrifice. Why, why do I have to sacrifice? Well, we'll find out in 1 John. First John, chapter 2, and in verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. This is why we got to sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed. And if we're to claim that we live in Jesus Christ, and, and we do, he said we must also sacrifice. We must live as Jesus did. And what are some of the ways that Jesus lived? Right? Like we, we have the Gospels. We have all the epistles. Jesus is someone who put the Father first in everything that he did. So Jesus sacrificed his life. Jesus' life and his family came after the Father. So for us, that has to be the same attitude. Our life, our family has to come after Jesus. Has to come after God. Not only did he put God first, but we know that from Mark chapter 3, he put the family of God before his physical family. We learned that in Mark chapter 3. And when we think about the life Jesus lived, I think it's important for us to understand Jesus growing up in Jewish culture, right? He would have been the oldest brother. We know that. Jesus was the firstborn. He was born to Mary as a virgin. So Jesus would have been the oldest of his brothers. Joseph was no longer in the picture. Many believe that he died. So Jesus would have been responsible financially for his family. Jesus would have been responsible for the well-being of Mary, for the well-being of his brothers. But what do we see? Jesus' life. Jesus' life is filled with preaching and teaching. Jesus' life is filled with spreading the gospel. Jesus' life is filled with seeking and saving the lost. That's what our life needs to be filled with as well. That's what mattered most to Jesus, was preaching. He said, that is why I have come to preach. And so that's what we must do as his followers. Preach. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are in the faith. All of us are called to preach. We must live like Jesus. And Jesus' life is filled with preaching. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, is what the scripture says. And so, you might ask, like, okay, like, do I really have to do that, though? Like, like, is, like do I have to do it because of, like, where I'm at in life and circumstances, situations? Yes. 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 All of us have to do it. In John chapter 12, In verse 24, this is what Jesus says. So do we need to sacrifice? Sacrifice our life? Yes. Here's why. John 12, 24. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. 
But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. What an incredible passage of scripture that we see here in John. And Jesus, he's, he, he talks about a kernel of wheat. Right? He says, hey, if, if a kernel of wheat dies, it's going to produce many more seeds. And he's talking about us. We are that kernel of wheat. And so what Jesus is saying is that we got to die if we're going to produce more seeds. We have to be willing to give up our life. As, even as Jesus says, to save it, to have it for eternal life. We got to give up our life. So what do we got to sacrifice this morning? What do we got to die to this morning? I think we got to have perspective. I know last week we talked about perspective. The perspective is that whenever you die, whenever you sacrifice, you offer yourself as a living sacrifice, what's going to happen? You're going to allow someone else to come to Jesus. You're going to give someone else the opportunity to come into contact with the blood of Jesus so that they too can be forgiven of their sins. That is why we need to sacrifice. That is why we need to die. We're the kernel of wheat that has to die. So we must die. Dying is not an optional thing. We must die in order to help other people have life. So what do we got to die to this morning? What do we need to sacrifice this morning? Maybe it's time. <clears throat> Maybe we got to sacrifice time. Our life can be so like me, 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 me. And it's just what I want. My desires, my plans, my goals, my dreams, my aspirations. Like, it can't just be filled with us. Like, you died. Like, we died. Our life is now hidden in Christ. So, so our life now we live for Jesus. So maybe we got to sacrifice time. Maybe that's an area of our lives that we got to sacrifice. Time. Maybe it's sleep. I'm in the boat of sleep right now. Who loves sleep? Sometimes. Sleep is incredible. <laughs> sleep is incredible. Every, everybody's got to sleep. Right? Like, you wake up well-rested, oh, you feel great. You, you wake up not well-rested, you might even be a little cranky. But maybe that's something we got to sacrifice, is sleep. You know, like, like how early do we wake up in the morning? Maybe that's something we got to sacrifice in order to help someone else become a Christian. we got to sacrifice our sleep. Right? Maybe that's an area of our life we've got to die to. You know, we learn that Jesus got up early in the morning while it was still dark. So if you're getting up and the sun's already risen, that's something to consider. Maybe you got to sacrifice sleep to live like Jesus. we got to sacrifice our life, right? Like, like, sacrifice your life. I think about the life that I lived before I became a disciple. I don't want to go back. I don't, I don't want that. I, I don't want any bit of it, any part of it. So, so I don't need to try to regain control of my life. No, my life is in God's hands. We don't have to regain control of it. We don't have to take control back. That's like why we became disciples. Because we were in control. And then life put us, because of our decisions, put us somewhere we didn't want to be. And we learned about the truth, and therefore we wanted to give our lives to Jesus. So why try to take it back? We got to sacrifice our life. <clears throat> we can't be... One thing I really want to put before us as disciples... Um, we cannot be God in our family's lives. Wow. Uh, we have to give God the opportunity to be God in our family's lives. But then also on the flip side, we can't allow our, our family to be our God. Like who we go to first. We have God first that we go to. But then we also have God's family that we need to come to. Because it says, Matthew 6... Everything will be given to us. Everything we need is going to be provided for. So we have to live out the scriptures in that way. 
Maybe it's the job. Maybe it's money that we got to sacrifice. We got to be willing to die to. Now I'm not saying like, all right, quit your job, like just like come, come and let's do full time ministry, everyone. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Keep your job. You got to have a job. Uh, you got to make money. We we gotta pay bills. Like there's things there's things we gotta pay. We gotta get food. You know what I'm saying? Like like it's unfortunate, but we live in a world where money money makes the world go around. Like unfortunately, that's just that's just the circumstances that we're under, right? But that that can't take us away from living like Jesus. The the career. The desire for as much money, and I don't think anyone has that heart here, but even if those are thoughts that you might have had before, we can't have that. We got to make money. We got to work. But we can't let those things take us away from living like Jesus. Right? So what is it in our life that we got to sacrifice to? What is it we got to die to? Think about it. Reflect on it. Albert Pike, someone who said this quote here, he says, What we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. Martin Luther King Jr. said, A man who won't die for something is not fit to live. As disciples... We have to sacrifice our lives so that other people can live. Amen? Bloodshed is the solution for success. My third point. Fight to the finish. Revelation chapter 12. Fight to the finish. <clears throat> Still alive this morning? Yes, sir. All right, all right, all right. We got, we got one more point after this. Come on, bro. Fight to finish. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Fight to the finish. We see here in this passage of scripture, very, very short one verse. But it says, rejoice in the heavens, but woe to the earth and the sea. Why? Because Satan, he's filled with fury and he lives amongst us. He's filled with fury. He wants to fight us. He wants to attack us. We know he wants to devour us. And then what does it say? It says that he knows that his time is short. You know... God lives outside of our reality, like the earth. God lives outside of that. He lives outside of the space and the earth and the real reality that we live in. God exists in a domain outside of this. At one point, Satan did too. And so he knows. That's why he knows his time is short. And he's filled with fury. And he wants to bring as many people with him to destruction as possible. And so for us, because we know there's a realm outside of the domain that we live in. Our time here on earth is going to come to an end. And it's short. Our life here on earth is short. Compared to eternity, think about it. That's like forever. Forever. Compared to, I don't know, maybe 80 years? Maybe 90 years? 100 years if some of us are lucky? Right? Like, think. 100 compared to forever. There's, there's, no, there's no think. It's just, it's unimaginable. Yeah. In the Bible, in James, it describes our life as a mist. Yeah. Right now, if, if any of us have a Febreze spray before, if you sprayed that Febreze and the mist went out into the air, how long did it last? Maybe three seconds? Yeah. Maybe four seconds? It says that's how long our life is. That is what we are, a mist. And so we got to fight to the finish. In Matthew chapter 24, we'll see a passage of scripture that I believe will help us fight to the finish. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. Matthew 
Matthew 24, 10. It says, At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. We got to fight to the finish. Here in this passage of scripture, Jesus says, many will turn away from the faith. So there will come a point in time where many people are going to walk away from Jesus. And many of Jesus' followers, while Jesus was still living on earth, turned away and walked away from Jesus. It says they'll turn away from the faith, they'll betray one another, and they'll hate each other. The things that, that God has saved us from, they would turn back to. Having a heart full of hatred. Having a heart that is just filled with betrayal. He goes on to say many false prophets will raise up and deceive many people. And then it goes on to say, because of the increase of wickedness, like because sin, because sin increases in our lives, maybe because sin increases in the world that we live in, it says that the love of most would grow cold because of the increase of wickedness. Sin hardens our heart. Sin hardens our heart. And, and so we got to understand, like, like, in a moment... It's, it's not a matter of like, yeah, you know, I just, I just gave in to whatever it may be. The temptation I was put before me to be angry, to be frustrated, to be impure, to, to have a lack of love. Whatever it could be, all of these things make our heart grow cold. It's the increase of wickedness, the increase of sin. So we got to understand that is what sin does to us. It makes our heart grow hard. Our love grow cold. And so Jesus says, but the one, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So what is it going to take? We got to stand firm to the end. Just because we're here right now doesn't mean that we're going to be here forever. Just because we're here right now doesn't mean we're going to be here next year. So we got to understand we are in the fight for our lives. We got to fight to the finish. We got to finish strong. We can't allow our love to grow cold. And so just think about, like, Jesus' love, the love Jesus had. Is that the same love that we have for the brothers and sisters? For the lost world, I think that's what really convicted me. There was a time when my wife and I, we were on campus at um, UC Irvine. And so we were there every day, UC Irvine. But it got to a point where at UC Irvine, I had to, like, I had to, like, make jokes in order to uh, just have a light heart about, you know, people saying no to the gospel. And, and I realized, like, I didn't have love for the lost. I didn't have love for the lost. Instead, what I would do is I would, I would crack a joke so that, that, you know, I thought my heart wouldn't get hard. But it already was. And so we got to have love. Right, we gotta be loving. So that's a great indicator. Do we have love for the loss? Do we have compassion on the loss? Do we have love for the brothers and sisters in Christ in the same way that Jesus did? Right, where we lay our life down for a friend. I'm willing to lay my life down for everybody in this room. We gotta have the same heart. That's the heart of Jesus. Right, we gotta fight. To the finish. We got to stand firm to the end. Just because we started out red hot. Doesn't mean we'll finish red hot. But that's what we got to do. We got to fight to finish red hot. You know I think. I think about the time when uh, I played football. I was a junior. I was 17. Um, it's so crazy. That's it's many years ago. Uh, <laughs> so I was 17. That was uh, 12 years ago I think. Um, so, as a 17-year-old, a junior, playing football, 
Um, we played this team. It was our first time playing them. But what was so what was so crazy is that by halftime, I believe we were up like 35 to zero. So so when if you if you've watched American football, um, you know like that's a lot. 35 to zero. That's five touchdowns to to no touchdowns, right there. Um, and so. So we, we were up, we were beating the team, and here's the thing. We just, we just got a little too excited. Like, the game is in the bag. We already won. Like, for sure, they're not going to come out in the second half, and they're not going to beat us. But third quarter comes by, they start scoring. We didn't score anything. Uh, and so I, I can't remember exactly what the score was in the third quarter, but fourth quarter comes by. We didn't score. We didn't score for the rest of the game. So we finished the game with 35 points. But the team that we were facing, they ended up scoring more points than us. And we lost the game. Because we didn't finish strong. We didn't finish strong. And so we, we have to know, we got to fight to the finish. We got to finish strong. We got to have a fight in us. And, and right now, we may be feeling weary. We may be feeling tired. I know, again, things have happened in our lives financially physically, emotionally, but we have to finish strong. Why? Because this is spiritual warfare. Our enemy is not going to relent. So we have a decision. Either we're going to fight or we're going to give up. And that's not an option. Giving up is not an option. Like just, just to be clear this morning, that's not an option for us. We have no option to give up. We got to fight to the finish. We have a relentless enemy. My last and final point is know yourself. Know yourself. Revelation chapter 12. And in verse 17, we're going to pick it up. Revelation 12, 17, it says... The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Know yourself. Here. Here this passage of scripture tells us. Like Satan's not waging war against people who are unaware that they're like not in war. Right? Like... Satan's not concerned about those people who don't know that there's a war going on. Instead, he's waging a war against you. Those who hold fast to their testimony about Jesus and who keep God's commands. That's who he's waging war against. And we have to know ourselves. You got to know yourself. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, it says, The Holy Spirit has been given to those who obey God. In Galatians 5, verse 25, it says, Live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. And we know the qualities or the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are all the fruits of the Spirit. Those are the things that, that should embody our life. Like, these should be the characteristics that we have on, on a given day. Love, joy, forbearance, gentleness. Right? Like, like these are the qualities of the Spirit. And it says, keep in step with the Spirit. Now, now, I could be honest. Some of these I always don't have at every given moment. Yeah. Right? Some of these I don't always have at every given moment. Why? Because I'm not keeping in step with the Spirit. It's, it's not a matter of like, oh, you know, this like, it's just too hard or the temptation is too great. No, I just, I'm not trying hard enough. Right? I got to know this is who God has called me to be. Not the sinful me. Not the one who gets frustrated or angry or is quick to anger or, or who has a lack of gentleness. Like, that's not me. That's what I've been saved from. But we got to keep in step with the Spirit. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to see another 
quality characteristic of the Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 1. So again, God has saved us from those things. Those things do not define who we are. And we got to fight not to give in to those things. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. This, this is what God says His Spirit does for us. It gives us love. This is who we are. God says that we're loving. So we can't say, oh, you know, like it's just hard for me to be loving. No, it's, it's, you just, you just got to make a decision. Okay, I got to be loving. Because, because the Spirit is one of love. It says that it's not timid. So we can't be shy. We can't be afraid to share our faith. We can't, be, we can't shy away from sharing our faith or shy away. Now, I'm not saying, like, go and, like, be confrontational in a bad way. But we do got to speak to people. We do got to confront people in Bible studies, right? We got to let people know where they're at. We can't be afraid of that. The weight of that, we can't be afraid of it. We can't shy away from it. We got to speak the truth. We have a spirit that is not timid. It says it gives us power. So the spirit that God has given us is one of power. It's the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the power of the spirit that lives within us. We are powerful. But we got to believe that. It says, we have this spirit of self-discipline. So we can be disciplined. You may feel like, or you may think, oh, you know, I'm, just, I'm not that disciplined. I need to grow in my discipline. That, that may be true, but the, the spirit that God gives you is one of discipline. We can say no to sin. We just got to put an effort, right? We just got to try, right? Like Jesus tells us, God tells us, go on the strength that you have. Go on the strength that you have. And he'll, he'll equip you the rest of the way. This is the spirit that God has given us. We can't be shy. We can't be timid. Don't shy away from anything. Right? But the spirit we have is one of power, love, and self-discipline. This is who we are. This is who we are. Not what the world tells us. Not what the circumstances make us feel like. Not what the trials or the hardships or the suffering may make us feel like. It may make us think something. That is not who we are. We are who God says we are. We have the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. We got to stop letting Satan and lies and accusations tell us who we are. No, it's, it's, it's God. It's Jesus. It's the scriptures. This is where we find out who we are every day. We get to see who God tells us that we are. And we got to hold to that. Don't believe the lie of Satan. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe the accusations. Don't allow Satan to deceive you that, that you are something else that God has said you're not. We are... Men and women who live by the Spirit. Power, love, self-discipline. You got to know yourself. I want to end out with a quote here. It says, knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. If you realize that you have enough... You are truly rich. God has given us everything we need. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1. God has given us everything we need to live a life of power, love, and self-discipline. He's given us everything we need to live by the Spirit. To live a godly life in Christ Jesus. We have it. But we have to know who we are. We have to fight to the finish. We have to know that there is one solution for success, that is bloodshed, and we have to know our enemy, and then we will be equipped for spiritual warfare, and to God be the glory.